Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Futurescapes and uh, to our guest today, uh, Dan Whaley, the um, CEO of Hypothesis, Hypothesis, uh, Hypoth.is, if I get it correctly there. Um, a darn hard to pronounce, but brilliant in action. Um, it, and, and it's just hypothesis. Um, there's <laughs> there's uh, no need to speak the punctuation. Um, <laughs> we we get that a lot, um, and it's and we've we've actually taken to start shortening it in in print form because it is um, it was meant to be clever, but too clever, I think. Dan, just explain um, uh, uh, what um, hypothesis is doing in the annotation space. How you came there. 10 years ago, I think, and, um, and uh, where you think you, 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 you are at the moment in, uh, what should we say, creating a collaborative network? Yeah, so uh, our mission is to bring a kind of a, is to bring new infrastructure for connecting people and ideas um, over the web, over every page of every document on every platform known to mankind, over all knowledge. Um, and, um, I wish I could take credit for this idea because it's a really old idea. This idea goes back to Vannevar Bush in the forties, who wrote a article, as we may think, um, which, which many people have read, which kind of imagines the web This is before, you know, any of this stuff, this was kind of a, a, a sketch on paper, so to speak, uh, imagining what might be possible with this kind of mechanical machine that would, the, uh, the sum of all knowledge. Um, and he imagined, you know, people would be able to collaborate, creating trails and, and kind of shared journeys through knowledge over, you know, using lots of these interconnected machines. Well, he basically invented the web and Wikipedia and annotation and a whole bunch of other things in a, a pretty revolutionary article. And, and honestly, we're just now in the year 2021, still getting around to implementing some of the basic stuff that he, you know, and, and others like him, Dewey was another one, uh, Dewey Decimal, um, but way, way, way back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen, um, you know, Tim Berners-Lee calls that annotation in his, you know, kind of uh, note, which, you know, kind of launched uh, the World Wide Web uh, um, vague but interesting, I think, was the comment of his uh, uh, of his uh, PI or his uh, superior. Um, and Mark Andreessen built um, um, a collaborative annotation capability into Mosaic in the browser in you know um, early '90s, and you know we have had and then turned it off after two months because you know too complicated. Um, and since then, we've had like 60 projects that have been come and gone have tried to do stuff like this. Um, and so we are, we said, how come those didn't work? And, and took the findings from that, the generosity of people who shared their, their experiences into what became the design inputs for Hypothesis um, as a nonprofit. Um, you know, it's gotta be standards-based, probably gotta be a nonprofit to begin with. Um, um, you know, for profits can innovate on top of that, but the hard part of the standards making and getting the stakeholders together initially needed to be nonprofit. Um, uh, and you know, stuff about browsers and design thinking and and some other things, but um, probably needed to be open source to begin with, um, as all of the major you know kind of implementations of browsers and things like that initially have been. Um, and um, so we're 10 years in, um, we're just kind of getting started. Um, we've, we've written a bunch of code, people are using it, have about a million users. Um, institutions are starting to use it to, for you know, bringing peer learning into the classroom. Journals are starting to use it to bring kind of post-pub peer review and kind of community you know, um, uh, reflection over scholarly works. Um, uh, you know, Washington Post is using it, uh, you know, over some of their pages. Uh, you know, we have lots of people using the libraries, uh, the the software libraries, to kind of implement their own stuff. Um, um, and you know, our goal is, um, you know, 
in a, in a, in another five or ten years, you know, that some of the most cloistered walled garden, you know, the apex predators of of proprietary um, content platforms, <coughs> Kindle, um, uh, will you will finally have to crack um, their mm -hmm. spine um, and uh, allow us to collaborate over the pages of the of the content that we've purchased. Um, so that we can have a, a, a little private book club in the margins of, of that book, um, so that we can see, you know, community layers of thinking over, you know, things like every, from everything from like Paradise Lost to the Bible, um, to the Quran, to, you know, you know, the, the newest pulp novel that you're, you know, has a fan base and, you know, wants to have different community groups. Um, and there's a, there's a notion um, if you take this to the extreme um, that I, I didn't coin, um, but a, a very thoughtful early team member of ours did called persistent ambient awareness. Um, and that is that wherever you are, you have the ability, um, if you so choose, to be aware of conversations and thinking and so forth of others that you follow, and maybe sometimes others that you don't, but that you're in control of that experience. Uh, that it's not a fire hose of spam or trolls coming at you, but that you can selectively kind of tune in um, to things um, that uh, that might be interesting. And I, I think the the benefit of this long term, the shorthand of it, is um, a kind of uh, is to you know really leverage some of that cognitive surplus in society um, for for good versus versus um, you know, kind of waste, I suppose. And, and secondly, to, to operate more socially, more efficiently, um, to get, um, you know, and you, and you think about this in, in the, um, um, uh, like in the si world of science, the, the role of the preprint is to accelerate the metabolism of discovery. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a yeah it'll get peer reviewed eventually and and you know you know you know close careful analysis will will point out things that can be improved but there's a real benefit to for somebody who's working in that field to be able to see even if it's just a shorthand uh, sketch of some really key research that's coming out this is particularly relevant in the COVID world with uh, you know the acceleration of bioarchive. Uh, and its influence and 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 role. Um, I'm going to I'm going to stop stop you there just a second, yeah. Dan, because um, I, I want to go into more depth around that piece of future vision, the yeah. social benefit, the um, um, uh, the persistent uh, um, uh, ambient uh, yeah. awareness issues. I think that's that's terrific. But first of all, I want to just tack back to the the ten years that you've been doing this. Yeah. Um, any surprises? I I, I was yes, very convinced. Lots. That the, <laughs> I was very convinced at the beginning that this would be the researcher's best tool, but actually, it's become faster moving in learners. It would be my perception than in researchers. Is that? Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, there's just some very simple reasons for that. Um, um, so surprises. Um, uh, and 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 just to to cut to the to the punchline on that, um, the it's it's really a cold start problem, um, and that that's that's the basic and and the benefit of a classroom is that the teacher can choose some tools and they can bring them to the class and, and they can, in a sense, you know, not I, I use enforce in in a in a kind of gentle way, but they can you know suggest that the classroom adopt a practice and then everybody does, and. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it's one of the, you know, one of the key reasons why we think education is a great place. Other than you know, one sixth of the planet Earth is in school. Everybody's in natural annotation and and peer learning are natural benefits um, to critical reading and learning and pedagogy. Um, and you know, and with then you know young minds that adopt these practices and tools can take them out into the world and and you know spread them around so um you know with the research community um you know we 
it is, um, you know, it is it is ad being adopted, but some of the stuff that's in the works right now, I'm, I'm particularly excited about, um, you know, in, in, in and around the preprint community and some of the projects that are working on you know, in, uh, fundamental improvements to kind of community review. Um, yeah. And uh, there's some really some great stuff in the works, and and uh, I think you know um, the good news is is you know kind of uh, standards based collaborative annotation is a is a great vehicle, um, kind of natural substrate uh, for some of that, and um, um, so that's yeah, that, yeah. I, I think that's um, uh, that's hugely encouraging. Um, uh, the um, and of course, we have uh, F1000, we have ORC, we have uh, all sorts of open platforms now, which are going to make this uh, subsequent to, to publication ongoing review mm -hmm. um, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, mention surprises, there's another one. Um, you know, initially I kind of started this my original itch was kind of a fact checking, you know, the public uh, dialogue and, you know, news and events and, you know, kind of things like that. Um, and so I kind of came to this as a kind of a fact in a fact checking frame. Um, but my, my biggest earliest surprise was, um, uh, well, there's been a bunch of them, but one of them was, was how much this was really um, uh, just useful as basic uh, collaborative kit, in a sense, um, for a wide range of applications, um, of which fact checking is a teeny little mm -hmm. slice, um, um, you know, a, a one percent type function um, in a in a much uh, you know richer world. Of, you know, it, it, you know, think how many tabs you have open in your browser every day, all day long, that are like Google Docs. Um, um you know and 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 equivalents um and you know a open you know uh uh standards based framework for that over all pages um you know kind of opens just opens up a lot of possibilities yeah absolutely absolutely um and uh and then just expand a little bit, if you will, on this uh, on on the social benefits. Are you seeing those? Are you, are, do you feel that people are, are reaping those? Certainly in the classroom, I would have thought that was the yeah. case. Yeah, and I, th I think um, you know the. I think solving the cold start problem is one of the challenges that these early folks had. I mean, it was in in some ways the only challenge. Um, now there were symptoms of the way that they approached the implementation that um, kept them from solving the cold start problem. Um, you know, not using open, not using standards, and kind of being advertising driven in terms of their business models and some other things like that. Um, but um, you know, the, the 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 how do we introduce something? in a ripe environment um, where we can get it in front of a lot of people and socialize them with a practice so that we can bring this kind of open framework and architecture to more and more verticals. Well, for us, education is that, um, is that perfect vehicle um, for a bunch of different reasons. And so in terms of the larger social benefit, I think, um, you know, we're seeing, seeing a little bit of it in, in you know, kind of post-pub, discussion around uh, in the sciences and folks are using this to as a deliberative framework uh, for you know climate news and things like that but it but the larger benefits will come from it being adopted in more and more you know kind of adjacent um, spaces by more and more people um, and so everything that we're doing is really focused on how do we get to critical mass yeah yeah do, do you see um the possibility i mean i've tried to concentrate futurescapes around 2025 and uh, uh and mm -hmm. i'd be interested in your in your thoughts about that as a as a, as to where you might be at that point but 
also, I'd like to, to know whether you see this breaking across into B2B areas. Yeah. And if, and if so, do you see any likely targets? Um, so I'd say the second question first, which is absolutely, um, you know, the, the applications inside the enterprise and inside, you know, other kinds of commercial applications are just absolutely enormous. Um, um, and, you know, those are, you know, natural kind of adjacencies for us, um, you know, just, and, and we see this as kind of the layers of the onion, maybe education first, research second, um, third would be um, uh, maybe private use of this by researchers inside enterprise. Um, so, you know, imagine that you're a researcher, you know, at, uh, you know, Genentech or something like that. Um, you will have be working on a lot of private stuff, but you also want to be interacting with public communities and aware of public discussions around public research. Um, and you want to be able to move between those contexts seamlessly. Um, just you know, flipping a uh, you know a small user control like a group switch or something in your conversation viewer. Um, and see private conversations that are maybe, you know, company confidential that are hosted on servers behind your firewall at the same time that you can see um, conversations that are happening, you know, in, in public spaces. Um, and that ability to kind of switch context, almost like you were just tabbing between two tabs in a browser, I think has a, a ton of, peril, of power. Um, and, you know, having this be universal standards-based kit for doing this that yeah. works with proprietary, you know, services running behind firewalls at the same time that it could listen to public conversations is, is essential for that. Um, and, um, you know, that's an area that we think a lot about. Mm. But a huge uh, amount of, en of engineering went into making that work. Yeah. And a lot of the, the good news is a lot of, you know, we've partly why to some people may it seem like our, product roadmap has been quite long and slow um, is that getting things built so that they could operate like that um, is been taken a lot of work um, and we preserved in a sense that outcome and that endpoint um, in all the work that we've done and that that's just you know that makes it harder um, than um, you know if we've taken you know more expedient uh, path. Um, another good example for us is uh, is government and law. Um, so, you know, governments are sees uh, are, governments are just the are the intersection of people and documents. Um, um, so governments, you know, make tons of documents from laws to regulations to memos to uh, you know briefings, um, internal, external. It's all about paper. Um, and uh, so having, you know, a flexible lens that allows people inside government to work and collaborate and people outside government, citizens, to um, um, in, in different layers um, with different focuses and different levels of expertise and agency to voice their opinion um, in, in ways that are, you know, um, in, in a sense, in a shared space. In a shared mechanism is super powerful, um, yeah. and uh, so that's another one that we're pretty excited about, um, and and have some ideas about, uh, you know, how to get started. Mm. So uh, back to that twenty twenty five issue. Um, yeah. uh, um, another five years. Um, do you do you have a sort of mental map of? Yeah. Uh, of where you'll be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd be surprised um, if you didn't. <laughs> well, well, first, I will say that, um, you know, and, and I don't know whether it's us, you know, who, or, or be somebody else, um, but this peer learning social annotation in the classroom is coming at warp speed um, everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, its benefits are really clear. Um, students love it, um, teachers love it. Um, and it can really evolve a lot to do more and be of more use 
both to students and instructors and so forth. I, first, I think students kind of need their own spaces a little bit. Um, um, and instructors need more powerful ways to share lessons and, and assessments and, you know, kind of uh, pedagogies and so forth with each other um, that they can reuse um, on top of texts. Um, but there's uh, the, the notion that, um, you know, that you'll just have to work with the text, like, you know, almost going back, like when I was a student, you know, you'd, you'd lug the paper textbook home and then you struggled through it, you know, maybe somebody on your dorm floor happened to be in the same class and, you know, you get together, and, you know, compare notes, but you were essentially alone um, and, you know, trying to learn on your own. And then you would go to class and, you know, try to catch up and, you know, maybe raise your hand if you felt comfortable with that getting, um, you know, a question answered. So I think the cool thing is now with what's, what's coming is it, you know, you'd really be able to benefit from um, collaborating with others, from others' insights, you know, the, being able to drop that uh, YouTube video that explains this concept right onto the page, you know, right onto the sentence where everybody was having the same, you know, question. Um, and, you know, people that are creating texts and creating learning uh, material can benefit from knowing where yeah. people are struggling. Um, and so this, this is coming, you know, at warp speed. And I would say by 2025, um, there will be few classrooms that don't use it in some way. Um, and, uh, you know, then, you know, we can start to, to you know, really expand uh, and, ma and magnify those benefits in, in other ways. Mm. Um, and uh, this has been a, uh, a huge process, as you, as you said, when you spoke of, of social benefits. And indeed, of the uh, of the uh, exploration of the of the uh, ambient perception area. Now, this has been a huge um, process in pushing out the boundaries of what the network means to to all of us uh, in our daily lives. What's your what, what what's your feeling about that? Do you do you see this as as uh, a first stage of something? bigger, are there other ways in which we will exploit our network, our mutual network connections? Yes. I think one of the biggest opportunities for, for humanity is what I call, you know, forensic journalism. Um, and there's a really interesting project, which some people have heard of, um, called Bellingcat, um, it's actually yeah. based in the UK. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if people are going to be listening to this, but it's B-E-L-L-I-N-G-A-T or G-I-N-G-C-A-T. Um, and, you know, these Bellingcat guys, they're the ones that figured out like exactly which, you know, missile launcher it was that shot down the, you know, the Ukrainian uh, jet, um, you know, and they figured out the cell phone number of the, of the Russian, uh, you know, FSU or the, the um, you know, kind of uh, secret intelligence guy that was running the, uh, that poisoned Navalny, you know, and, and then <laughs> called him up and interrogated him for an hour uh, without him really knowing who it was. And, and just the way that they work together collaboratively over source material in a very fine grain way to, um, to with a very directed end, which is nonpartisan and really focused on just understanding and teasing apart, you know, kind of what's going on, I think is a is this wonderful example of kind of a, a postpartisan world in which um, we, you know, the, the, the citizens can hold, you know, our, our agents, you know, the, the, our governments as um, to a much higher standard of performance um, and really sidestep a lot of this just crap um, and noise that, that we deal with every day. I, that, that's a hope. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an idealist and I, I know humans are, um, you know, a creatively flawed lot. Um, um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's always some new, um, you know, speciation of of uh, pain that that we're able to find to to inflict upon ourselves, but um, 
I, I do think that we can we can be better. Um, and you know, tools like you know, kind of collaborative annotation and so forth can be part of um, that solution, but only if they are created in these standards-based open ways where, um, you know, kind of like a Firefox browser, you know, it's really just there um, in service to you um, and it, it stays out of the way and just stays in its lane and does what it's supposed to do. Um, but through it, you have a powerful window onto the world um, that's, um, that you can accomplish all the things that you, that you need to do. I think that's a wonderful piece of vision, Dan. Um, uh, I didn't know that when I started this call with you this evening that I, uh, I would hear the words post-partisan, but my goodness, they do give one a ripple of hope um, mm. <laughs> and a yeah. sense that there may be a world um, which delivers what social media once promised. Yeah. Was... Um, a, uh, a, a which we say a, a noiseless exchange person to person where yeah. everybody could be heard. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you my two the two big problems I see with social media. Um, number one, it's uh, it's a bucket of everything. Um, you go to a Twitter or a Facebook. Um, you know, Twitter is you know it's one it's one big channel. Right. Um, I mean, you have hashtags, but it's basically one big channel with one fire hose of, you know, hundreds of millions of tweets a day. And you try and you're just getting blasted um, by a bunch of random shit. Um, and, um, you know, Facebook is, you know, I suppose you could say it's <laughs> people, people will scream in agony as I say this. It's, it's marginally better in the sense that it's only your circle right but then it's got all the other issues and it's you know advertising driven and essentially you're, it's basically a um a large arena kind of like almost like a gladiator pit in which you um are you know they're you're being tossed um these kind of ad grenades at you know which are you know get weaponized and you know kind of used for all kinds of scurrilous ends plus our familial networks are not that's the wrong um, selection criteria to decide who we want um, to have conversations with, right? Because it's basically just a bunch of random people. People don't pick their families, right? Or they're, you know, the people, they do pick their friends, um, which is marginally better. But what we need are layers, community layers that are really purpose specific, that are layers of expertise of people that are either formal or self-organized um, that, that are there to do work of a certain kind, um, to do investigation of a certain kind, um, and where you can understand the relative knowledge of the participants um, with respect to each other. Um, and that's where I think some of the, you know, kind of more focused effort of, um, you know, of this kind of, that we can see the, the kind of benefit from. I mean, I, I want to, you know, choose my five constitutional uh, or or parliamentary um, uh, knowledge specialist layers and and follow them so that I'm when I'm looking at a bill in Congress, um, I can see what is careful analysis of like draft legislation or something. Uh, and you know, because there's a PDF of some leaked you know bill coming out of subcommittee and. Um, and you know these folks kind of tear it apart, right? Because mm. Lord knows our legislators don't do it before they friggin' vote on it, um, and uh, you know, and they point out the parts that you know are you know obviously jammed in there by some you know uh, you know lobbyist um, at the last minute um, and and flag them, and and so that kind of behavior becomes less possible to do, and yeah. without tools. Um, it's difficult to kind of engage in that work. Well, thank you very much. I think um, uh, uh, we, we, we have our time now and, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, we must cease troubling you with questions anymore, but to have a conversation with someone with such a vision of connectivity and such a hopeful frame of mind is pure privilege. Thank mm -hmm. you very, very much indeed, Dan. You're so welcome. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I wish you a, a good day with very many thanks from the Futurescapes listeners. Thank Terrific. you. Yeah, you're welcome.
It's my pleasure.